While the Sino-American conflict rages in Alaska, a convoy of American forces and hardware travels north through the newly annexed Canadian territories, drawing disapproving stares from the onlooking Canadian loyalists. Countered among the convoy is a platoon of West Tech Minuteman Transporter Erector Launcher, or TEL, vehicles, deployed with a payload of bunker-busting, medium-range, miniaturized Minuteman V missiles for use on Chinese emplacements along the front. The Minuteman system makes efficient reuse of the West Tech Hermit's APC predecessor's surplus chassis that were phased out as the newer vehicle system became available. As a result of its APC ancestry, the Minuteman features a largely useless frontal cannon, track-based locomotion, and enhanced survivability. Grafted onto the hull is a Patriot missile launcher system capable of erecting and launching two mini Minuteman missiles in a time span of no greater than 10 minutes. The Minuteman platoon formed a vital component of the United States artillery arsenal, and as such was rarely seen deployed stateside, with the majority of their number being sent to the front lines both in Alaska and overseas. Howdy folks, Spy Dingo here. I hope you enjoyed the head cannon I just whipped up for the missile carrier that graces Fallout 4's intro cutscene and the Fallout universe for about six seconds. It is my goal today to immortalize this vehicle system in such a way that you might actually be able to remember it exists tomorrow. Because I bet you, like me, tend to forget the Minuteman the second the vault door closes, shielding your sorry meat sack from atomic annihilation. So join me, if you please, for a journey through some historical examples for context, a passionate pros and cons section, a few open questions, and then some idle musings about the possible use cases for such a vehicle in the Fallout universe. The missile carrier is refreshingly unique in such a way that it was incredibly difficult to find a particularly accurate historical facsimile. The vehicle is somewhat of an oddity for going with a tracked configuration rather than pneumatic tires, in combination with carrying two large, but not ICBM large, missiles and retaining a truck-like cabin. The Soviet 2K11, not the video game or the publisher, Krug is fairly similar to the Minuteman, being a tracked TEL, capable of carrying two 3M8 surface-to-air missiles, in addition to featuring a distinct chassis and launcher sections. In contrast to the similarities, the Krug does not feature the truck-like armored cabin and has a significantly more robust launcher mechanism. In comparison, the United States M270 multiple rocket launcher vehicle developed by Ling Temco Vought in the late 70s shares the tracked configuration in addition to a visually similar cabin, particularly in the boxy windshield protectors and headlight regions, but obviously has a wildly different launcher configuration and a rather different chassis silhouette with the Minuteman chassis having much more curvature in the track armor. Finally, I'd like to talk about this tracked scud launcher I found on the interwebs, whose names for the life of me I can't seem to track down. So if any of you fine viewers out there know what this variant of scud launcher is actually called, please be sure to let me know in the comments below. I personally think this system is the closest to the Minuteman in resemblance, featuring slightly sloped track armor, a distinct cabin area, random equipment lashed to the boxy nose of the vehicle, fuel tanks mounted on the side, and a rear-mounted launcher that, although only carries a single payload, has the scaffolding-like vibe that the in-game vehicle also features. Combine that with the aforementioned cabin features from the M270, in addition to scaling down the scud launcher portion to mount two smaller units, and I feel like you've pretty much arrived at the in-cutscene model. I'd love to hear if you agree. Now, without further ado, it's on to the pros and cons section, which in this case will be utterly one-dimensional thanks to the single six-second shot I have to work with. Good thing they say a picture is worth 1,000 words, right? Wonder if that means a video is worth like 100,000. I sure hope so for my sake. All right, that's enough preamble. Let's jump into the pros. I actually quite like the missile carrier aesthetically. For one, the chassis looks like it could have belonged to an actual tank. It's a real pity the Chrysler's Patton can't say the same with its quad track monstrosity of a chassis, both from a looks perspective, but also from a narrative perspective. I mean, think about it. Wouldn't it be great to say the missile carrier was adapted from a Patton chassis like is so often done in the real world? I sure think it would. 
a missed opportunity there for sure. For two, the details of the chassis are also a nice touch. From the inclusion of what I assume to be a spare track on the side, to the footholds, to the included drive wheel, it's all solid. Not to be outdone, the armored cabin looks fairly functional. There is clearly a door. Sadly, a call out that has to be made far too often in the Fallout universe and a hatch providing for multiple means of entry and perhaps more prudently, escape. We can also glean from the few frames that we get to see of the cabin's front that the windshield is heavily armored and also it exists. Again, a thing that I really shouldn't have to call out, but it is what it is. Honestly, other than the inclusion of that frontal gun, I don't have any serious complaints in regards to the cab to speak of. Then the launcher aspect of the vehicle is quite striking, owing mostly to the impressive scale of the missiles that she is packing, but also due to the inclusion of supporting details such as well-defined hydraulic arms and a visually interesting superstructure. Finally, the missile carrier shares with the Chimera the rather rare honor of being a bona fide animated land vehicle in the Fallout universe, even if that is just in a throwaway cut from an intro that no one's going to remember. I'm going to count it. Next up, we kick off Mission Critical Operation Cons, starting with my concerns in relation to the scale of the chassis in comparison to the payload of missiles. Honestly, it's hard not to feel like the missile carrier is compensating for something, packing not one, but two of these thick boomsticks, and I'm not sure its frame is up to the task. In researching the historical vehicles we discussed above, I got to take a gander at a wide variety of transporter erector launchers and multiple erector launchers, and generally did not see missiles of this scale being transported in pairs by many of the systems. Though that's not to say it didn't happen. The previously discussed 2K11 Krug does seem to be transporting a payload of similar size and two of them. So I'll acknowledge it is possible. The main distinction I see though, is the fact the Krug has a significantly more robust lifting structure, at least so far as I can tell. In contrast to the Minuteman system, which only features two rather frankly flimsy looking hydraulic arms. That being said though, I'm certainly the wrong type of engineer to make a definitive call on such things, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on the matter. Now, let's talk about the tracks. Visually, I love the choice of tracks. Don't get me wrong, and I think the track configuration is pretty integral to being able to support the load of two missiles at once if that's possible. It seems to me though, the more realistic approach would be to reduce the payload to a single salvo and leverage pneumatic tires. I mean, think about it, with only two ostensibly high range munitions, what would be the tactical need to deploy this vehicle system off road? A tire configuration would without a doubt be faster moving on infrastructure, at least in relation to the tracked version, and thus, I believe would be more beneficial. That way the unit could be moved quickly into position, launch its strike package, and then bug out to resupply. Minding a similar vein of thought, the inclusion of a frontal gun on this system is just plain stupid. Although I can somewhat logic this away as a holdover from the chassis previous life, I still think it should have been removed here to save some weight. In addition to the fact such an armament would never be put in a situation where it was to be used. To me, I see it in a similar light to the F-22 pilot needing to use his or her gun. If you've gotten to that stage of the engagement, something has gone horribly wrong on both sides of the battle. In my final con, I've simply got to lament the fact this vehicle system doesn't actually exist. All things being said, this design probably would have been my favorite land vehicle of the series, and if it wasn't for the existence of the vertebrate, could have been my favorite full stop. Considering the carrier exists for those tantalizing few seconds of intro, I find it truly odd that the asset didn't make it into the game, making me wonder if perhaps Bethesda outsourced that bit of work and didn't actually own the asset used, though I know little of production realities, so I could be totally off base here. Now for a heaping slice of open questions that keep me up at night, so I hope you're hungry. My first question for you, my dear viewer, is what do you think the tanks on the top of the chassis are for? Fuel or coolant storage maybe? I rather hope in that case that it's the latter and not the former, as bolting a near literal bomb to the hull of the vehicle system pretty much makes the whole armored component a complete waste of time in my opinion. Or how about additional hydraulic fluid? in case the system springs a leak? Also, what the heck is going on with the bumper? At first, I thought it was carrying tank obstacles, like the Czech Hedgehog in module pieces, that is to say, two of the X-shaped hunks of steel, 
could be deployed together to form a barrier. But then I got to looking at it more, and now I'm far less convinced. First of all, how would those pieces slot together? Perhaps the segment that is stowed within the nose and is therefore out of sight is notched in some way? Then I got to thinking that a regular old flatbed would be better suited for such a task anyways. With that in mind, could the Minuteman double as some sort of mine clearing vehicle and what we are seeing as some sort of mine flail plow type of device? Or is this feature just some sort of peculiarly shaped armor of some sort? Then in my final tangential, far less serious question, I must ask why the heck is Home Slice casually wearing a gas mask? I mean, it kind of makes sense in the post-war era, given radiation is, well, everywhere. But pre-apocalypse? It just seems bizarre to be wearing a gas mask while on the march. I mean, none of his squad mates are doing the same, suggesting there isn't an imminent threat of radiation, and the civilian onlookers look similarly calm. So is he just maybe the greenest soldier of the bunch and is still following army regulations he learned at boot camp last month? Or is this soldier just some sort of Le Creuset or Kirito edgelord with a power level over 9,000? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Now that I've aired my burning questions to you fine folks, I'd love to conclude our time together talking about the possible use cases for the West Tech missile carrier, starting from the use case I find least plausible to the use case I find most. The first use case is unfortunately the one I yearn for the most. I'd love the carrier's mission profile to be that of a surface-to-air missile launcher, or SAM launcher. You see, the distinct lack of anti-air equipment of any kind in the U.S. military arsenal has always bothered me to the core, especially considering the Fallout 3 and New Vegas nuclear weapons took on the form of the airdropped Fat Man and Little Boy, Lonesome Road notwithstanding. The Minuteman missile carrier could fill this gap reasonably well, being both highly mobile, feasibly being capable of downing two adversarial bombers at long range, creating a reasonable deterrent to the aerial bombing strategy that does not rely on dogfighting. I have no trust in the Stingray Deluxe. Sadly, there are several reasons why I feel that this is not the case. Reason number one, has to do with the missiles themselves. Generally speaking, anti-air weapons have multiple sets of control mechanisms, be that fins, thrusters, or what have you, in order to correct their flight path en route to a kill. In contrast, the in-game missiles feature only a single set of fins and no other discernible control mechanisms. Reason numero dos is the fact there really isn't any indication of there being onboard radar or advanced detection systems. Without such systems, it's pretty much inconceivable that this platform could be used for aerial engagements. The final reason is the inclusion of the frontal gun is a feature that simply doesn't make sense for this mission profile. The next possible role I envision for this system is that of an intercontinental ballistic missile strategic nuclear weapon launching system. This could provide the US military with a mobile launching platform that would be significantly less vulnerable to first strike engagements and thus enhance the deterrent threat. Where this falls apart for me though is again the missiles themselves. Looking at real world ICBMs, these things are huge in contrast to the carrier's payload. That being said, good old daddy Google was nice enough to stock my search history and serve up an article on Pulsar Fusion's new experimental missiles. That, as the company name suggests, derived thrust from, well, Fusion. Although the Pulsar missile is slated to be the largest in the world, we know the Fallout universe was far more advanced in the Fusion department, suggesting to me a company like Mass Fusion could have developed significantly smaller ICBMs than today's conventional munitions using Fusion propulsion tech. I'm still not entirely convinced, however, because the Fusion core can't even last a man a trip across Boston. So by the transitive property, it's really hard to believe these missiles can, you know, cross continents. Oh. And of course, the gun makes zero sense in this scenario as well. Finally, and most plausibly I might add, the missile carrier is a mid-range surface-to-surface weapon system as presented in the intro scenario. This seems the most likely to me due to the following factors. The size of the missiles, the lack of control mechanisms on the missile, the absence of sensor systems, the tracks allowing for deployment in closer proximity to the front lines, and the fact this somewhat and I mean somewhat justifies the existence of the turret due to the aforementioned
proximity to the front. In this scenario, the carrier could be equipped with either standard bunker-busting munitions or tactical nuclear weapons and would operate in a supporting role similar to a self-propelled gun. Sadly, as you might suspect, this is my least favored mission profile, as I feel like the US military already has quite a few assets that could fill this role, such as the howitzers from Fallout New Vegas and the Chrysler's Patton SPG from Fallout 4. Oh well, what can you do? Which of the three scenarios do you think the missile carrier was designed for? Or can you think of any mission profiles I might have missed that the carrier could have filled? I look forward to seeing you in the comments. With that, my friends, I call this video to a close. Not a bad amount of content from six seconds of reference material, if I do say so myself. I do hope y'all agree. Thanks so much for spending your most valuable resource, your time, with me. If you enjoyed and would like to help the word of Spy Dingo spread, sting that like button like you're a Cazador and consider subscribing today. Special thanks to my man Isaac for reminding me once again that this vehicle system even existed. And as always, I couldn't do this without my subscribers and awesome channel members. You guys are the best. Spy Dingo out.